Hey, what up, y'all? Welcome back. Replicon Radio. Uh, we have a very special guest interview today, uh, referred to as the sc- Scream Queen. Uh, what a, a, she's becoming an iconic Scream Queen, if you will. Um, you may know her from her music. You may know her from her movies. You may know her as her iconic character, Batty Boop. But uh, get up for Miss Victoria Demar. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah! Hey. Yeah! The crowd goes wild! Woo. <laughs> that is perfect. How are you today, Miss Damar? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Thank you, Paul. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to, to call in and hang out with us here at Replicon Radio. I know a lot of our listeners are we're really excited to hear from you, so uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule for that. Sweet. Thank you to everyone who's listening and tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, so essentially what we like to do, um, obviously we want to talk about what's going on now, but before we do that, we want to get to know you. We want to know, we want to learn all about you and how everything got started. I know you, you were, I guess you were born in Delaware and then you ended up going to, uh, to New York for school. Like how did, like, where did your journey begin? It wasn't necessarily in movies and stuff. Like how did everything kind of get started for you in your, your life? Oh boy. (laughs) (laughs) In the very beginning of my life. Well, well maybe not your not. whole life. I mean, you know, you were born, <laughs> you you had dreams, you went to school. I mean, you, essentially, you went to school for something besides where you are now. I guess it's probably a good, a good, you know, what I mean, like you were, you were, you started your journey on a different path than the one that you ended up being on, right? I did, yeah. Um, my mother was a professional ballet dancer, so I got into the performing arts very young as a professional ballet dancer. Um, I danced for a couple professional regional companies and major companies um, in the U.S. with some guest artist appearances in the Virgin Islands, which was really fun. Um, so once I went to school in, to New York, I um, had initially auditioned for Juilliard. I wanted to be um, a Juilliard alum. That was my dream. And I had auditioned there and NYU as a dance major. And I didn't pass the scholastic part of my acceptance at um, Juilliard because unfortunately my uh, SAT scores at the time were subpar. So they have a really rigorous um, acceptance um, experience there. You have to be admitted um fully on on both sides they they review you artistically and everything you have to offer artistically and then they also review you scholastically and artistically they invite you for a full um eight hour day audition where they give you a lunch break and everything um and at the end of that day uh, they have like a list of like people on the door um from however many people started the the day at the audition and who that they were admitting artistically and so I was invited to that audition. I went and I was one of the 10 names left on the door. And I think there was just under a hundred people auditioning. Um, so I was really excited. I was like, yeah, I'm halfway there. And then, um, my, my grades and, um, my transcript from high school was very strong, but my SAT scores were really weak. So, um, they passed on me. Um, there was a little bit of a wait list, uh, for a while and then they, they passed. So I went to, um, NYU because they had admitted me at my audition. I, you had to go audition there where it wasn't a full eight hour day. It was, um, it was an audition. You had a, a, an audition piece of your choice to present and then it was an interview and that was it. Um, so I pre- presented my audition and then I went to the interview and the woman said, if you want to come here, Victoria, we want you. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, at least I got in somewhere, my second choice, whatever, at least I can still be in New York. Um, so I was really thrilled after I started attending NYU, um, as it was such an amazing school and the village, the West village of New York city is really awesome. And I was having a really good time, but, um, I was really seriously into ballet. So I had auditioned for some companies there in New York city, um, and was admitted to the Joffrey ballet company as trainee. So, um, I took that opportunity and I took that job and that's when I switched my major. Um, I was really interested in course, um, in theater arts and everything about performing in the theater. Um, but I was also really interested in, um, TV and radio journalism. So, uh, I switched, I, I took the Joffrey ballet job and then I switched my majors. I didn't need to be a dance major anymore, um, to theater arts and broadcast journalism. So that's where the shift to, uh, to theater really began. I had always had an interest in acting. I made a short film when I was 13 years old, um, that I start, wrote and starred in, uh, called Sweet Suspicion. 
it was a thriller about this young girl who uh, masterminds a, sl a slower um, a family member, an uncle, to uh, to take out her whole family and to kill her whole family. Oh, wow. um, so it was it was kind of super fun, and um, so I'd always had an interest. So once you know, I'd really solidified the path of a professional dancer at such a young age. Um, that's when I really, really got into theater. That's awesome. So you, so you were into the. You, did you start with the journalism side, or were you kind of doing it all at the same time and just had a love for for what you know? I'm kind of doing it all at the same some, somehow. Yeah, I was kind of doing it all at the same time. Um, I was on NYU Tonight. I was an anchor on NYU Tonight, which was the the student news station. And I was also on um, WMYU, which was their radio station. Um, so I was, you know, dabbling in a little of everything. When I first graduated, actually, I'd gotten a job for WCBS News Radio 88, which is a 24-hour news station in New York. Um, and I was really thrilled because they were... Um, taking two new employees that year and um, they took me and actually another classmate of mine from NYU. So we were all very excited um, to, to have gotten that job, but um, I didn't stay at that job very long because I'd gotten an audition for a film out in Hollywood, California that I was certain I was going to book uh, and came out uh, to, to hit the movie scene. And that was the, uh, that was the super exciting, awesome uh, audition for the Dennis Hopper film. Um, it was, and you know, like I, it was called help for ransom and I was so super excited and, you know, I'm standing there and I, like, I'd never really gotten this far in, especially in a film audition. I wasn't auditioning for a lot of films in New York. And if I was, they were student films, um, which I was already like a star in student films at NYU because all my friends were film majors and such. And so they, you know, we all put each other in our films and, and our projects and stuff like that. So I had already been in many, many student films. But um, when I came out to Hollywood, it was a whole different ball game, of course. And, um, you know, I was just kind of like, they were like, yeah, they love me. And I was like, yeah, all right. Like, when do we start? You know, and they were like, well, we'll, we'll let you know. And I was like, well, fuck, because I was <laughs> staying in a hotel with like my two cats and like, you know, I had less than a thousand dollars to my name and, um, you know, no place to live. Um, my car needed repairs. And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And I had a manager at the time in New York. And phoned him and was like, so, like, now what do we do? And he was like, well, now we wait. And then, of course, I didn't get that job. But um, I, I the, and that actually ended up with a, a horrible downward spiral, which which landed me being homeless in the streets of Hollywood for about two months. Um, but I did actually um, get other jobs and other films. And I was actually able to secure a residence. And I swear when I got that first apartment, I, I thought I had just made it in Hollywood then because I, when you're homeless and you have nowhere to go and nowhere to live and then you procure a place to live, yeah. I was like doing carpet angels like in my living room, like I have a place to live <laughs> and bad, like yeah. was so, I was so excited, you know, and like got a phone line. I was like, I have a phone. I have a place to live. I can do anything. You know, I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, you know, surviving off the dollar menu at, you know, Wendy's, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was quite a tedious time. <laughs> That's crazy. But yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. So yeah, like you literally went from New York all the way to LA in your head. You thought you had this big gig with, Di with Dennis Hopper, which is, I mean, huge. And then totally. you, know, you end up homeless in the other side of the country. <laughs> like you don't, you don't know anyone. I, I would assume like, how did yep. you like. How, I mean, I, I assume you would, you picked up whatever job you can get to get by for then. Like, when did you first kind of like? What was you, were you getting commercials? Like, I know a lot of actors start that way. Like, what what was kind of you know, your first couple moments there? And then I know you said you got the apartment is when you felt like you kind of made it. But was there an actual moment? I mean, was there a moment where you're like, okay, I'm actually an actress now. Like, I can actually do this. Was there like a was there like an epiphany or any, anything like that? You're like, all right, I got this now. You know, like when I was a little kid, like seven and eight years old, I used to put on performances in my driveway and use like the uh, garage as my backstage. And I would do all these dance performances and performance art kind of pieces and such. And I'd, you know, post flyers on the fridge, you know, the week before and I would sell tickets for 25 cents. And basically it was just my mom and dad and my grandma that came. And, um, I, you know, I treated it like, you know, I, I was the promoter, I was the choreographer, I was the performer, I was the producer, you know, I was, the, I was the, you know, the house, um, a patron cleaning up the, the, the aisles and putting out the chairs and, you know, doing all that. So, I mean, when I, when I was like seven, eight years old, I already, I already thought that I, I, I already considered myself a, a performer. So, 
Um, when I came out to Hollywood and I was actually, you know, in the mix and like doing this, I was just going and buying um, Backstage West from like 7-Eleven at like midnight on it. It used to be um, that this was the actual paper that used to be distributed on Thursdays. But if you were a subscription member or you went and purchased it at night at a bookstore or 7-Eleven, um, you could get it the Wednesday night before, which seemed to be I couldn't afford a subscription at the time. So it seemed, I mean, and I couldn't even get the paper every week. So I think it was like $3 and I couldn't even afford the $3 every week. It was like, um, $3, like two things to eat on the dollar menu and some cat food or buying backstage West. All right, I'm going to have to get the food this week. So that was kind of a debacle at the time. But, um, I would get that paper and just submit to absolutely every job that paid. I never submitted to any jobs that didn't pay because it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't have any money as it was. So why would I do work as an actor unpaid? So I, I never took work unpaid because I needed to, you know, keep my apartment that it took me two months to get after absolutely. living in my car and on the street. So um, I just started submitting to everything in the first um job that I really got was a dinner theater production um, that I was really excited because um, part of the compensation, like they paid you nightly for your performance. And part of the compensation was also a meal. So I was so fucking thrilled to get this job. So I was like, <laughs> okay, food and money. And it ran for like about six weeks. And I, and I was, and I remember just celebrating and like calling my mom and screaming, like I got a, I've got a, like a full-time acting job. And she was like, Do, you know, on what show? And I'm like, no, <laughs> a dinner theater in LA. And she was like, what? You know, like, you can survive on that? So I was really excited. And, you know, through there in that production, I met a lot of actors that were really actually fantastic and really inspiring. And I kind of got this small little group of of friends um, who really inspired me and were all, like, in the grind like I was. And so it, it, it really gave me hope and I was like you know this is it I'm, I'm, I'm in the running now this is what it's going to be like but um, I, I used all my skills as a performer and as an actor as a vocalist as a model you know any, any skills that I had um, to, to get jobs I never took you know a shit job waiting tables or bartending or hostessing or, or hosting in a, a restaurant or a nightclub I um, I never did that. I never, I never had one of those jobs. I never waited tables or worked in any, uh, bar or nightclub in LA. So, um, it, it, but it was very hard and that was a choice of mine. You know, when you get so destitute, um, you know, you're like, I just need any job, any money, anything, but, but, you know, there's, there comes a, a, a time where you have to choose whether fear is going to control you and to control every action that you make, or you're going to go, you know what, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not going to take that shit job in that office or working in a retail store. Not that there's anything wrong with those jobs, but that wasn't my dream. That wasn't my career. That wasn't my skill. That wasn't what I loved. And I was damn determined to dedicate what my life to what I loved and to, to hold out for those jobs where I was really using my skills. So that Therefore, I was working on jobs that I loved and I put my best foot forward. And I think fear controls a lot of people. You know, they want to go do this other thing, but how are they going to make enough money to survive? Well, every single day, still 20 years later, I look at the calendar and I go, okay, I got to fill up every day here, 30, 31 days, 29 days, whatever, so I can survive, so I can eat, so I can pay all my bills. I mean, I'm still doing it 20 years later. And I believe that every month that I will, and I do. So it's just a, it's just a question of mindset. I was... Um, I was determined to do something and it was, uh, it, you know, it was do it or die. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's awesome. I know you can't see me, but I'm literally like just over here nodding my head in, in appreciation. Like, yes, because that's, because that's so true. Because so many people fall into that. They have these dreams and they, they need to survive, which isn't necessarily, like you said, a bad thing. But you were like, no, I need to survive doing what I love, which just made exactly. you a little more hungrier than the next person. And, and here you are exactly. still today. So that's awesome. Like, Thank you. I had a, a friend ask me one time who had aspired to be a musician and he decided to give up, up on that and is, is doing something completely different, has a completely different career. And he's he's still unsatisfied. He's still unhappy. He goes to his job every day and yeah, he makes a living and yeah, this and that. But that's not his passion. It's not, he, not what he wanted. And he asked me one time, um, like, you know, ha like, but how did you like, how did you survive? And it was just like, I because I like, he was like, oh, this is what he asked me. And he was asking me, like, how did you survive? But, like, like you didn't have, like, what was your plan B? Like, how could you not have a plan B? And I said, Be because there wasn't any plan B. Because I, I, nev I never had a plan B because, there to me, there was no plan B. It was, 
I'm an actor. I'm a performer. This is what I do for a living. And I have great big gigantic goals and accomplishments, you know, that I want to achieve on the far end, just like anyone does in their life. But to me, there wasn't there wasn't a plan B like because if you if if you're afraid that plan A is not going to happen and you formulate a plan B, it's plan B is going to be what you're doing is going to want is going to take over because that fear is going to control you to, well, I might not be able to make a living at that. So I'm going to take this job over here. Like he started to take all these other pickup jobs because he couldn't make a living as a drummer. But what he really wanted to do was make a living as a drummer, but he was too afraid that he wouldn't. So he had this plan B and now of course, plan B became, became his life and he's still miserable and he's still wishing that he, uh, that he had quote, you know, made it as, as a drummer. And, you know, to me, I, it's like, well, you gave up on yourself. So, you know, you only have one life. I, you know, if you, you know, it's just, it sucks when people that are close to you give up on you, but if you give on up on yourself, that's the root of the problem. And I've never given up on myself. That's awesome. That's, that's so true. And it's so inspirational and caps off to you for that. Cause that's awesome. And it, it's crazy how many times, um, you know, with now I'm doing the show and I interview a lot of people like I hear that same thing so often, not obviously the same story, but the, there's no, we can't, we didn't have a plan B. We didn't have another option. Yeah. Everyone else fell to the wayside. We're still here. Like that's a hard thing to yes. do as a human, let alone, you know. It, it's very hard. And, and I do get terrified. But as soon as that terror kicks in, I realize that this giant kind of just like your programming that kicks in that you're kind of like born with and you and it's really hard to get out of that kind of programming because that's all you know from birth. But then I go up. Oh, I, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let that fear control me. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to make the rent. I'm going to pay my bills. I'm going to do it be, because I because I have to. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's awesome. Um. So as you're, uh, I guess you know you're, you're out there. You're doing your thing. Um. We. I recently talked to uh, John Lachago. I want to know how did you end up meeting him? Because I know you guys have done a lot of things together, including. Uh, you know, obviously, Batty, which became huge for you. But how did you guys end up initially meeting? And you were, I guess, you were in the Bio Slime uh, Contagion movie to begin with. Is that right? Or I was, yeah. I met John Lechago a long time ago. I want to say it was two thousand two, two thousand one, or two thousand two. And um, I met him right when he rapped on his production Blood Gnome, which actually ended up being a really successful. A film for him and um at the time he was partners with um scott evangelista and vincent balancio and randy mermel in a company called turning point films um the four of them had this company and they had produced uh, blood gnome and they were moving on to a film called a zero blood from the sam uh, that Julie Strain and I actually starred in, which unfortunately never got um never got a release they they did um like a limited release of the like a just a turning point films release of a limited like collector's edition dvd but it never got like a wide um nationwide or worldwide release from a real distributor which was unfortunate so maybe um maybe that will be remedied in the future but um i just remember um meeting john at that turning point film studio and he was so charismatic and i was so excited about his film he was showing me um everything that was going on with blood gnome and i was like oh it's too bad we just met now and i couldn't audition for that and he was like yeah 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 and um and then he was kind of in and around the set when I was working on Azira and kind of watching me. And then I did a film in 2004, which I think was released in 2005, called Shadows by Dan Donnelly. And um, I played this really sassy, uh, bitchy, manipulative girl, um, college girl in this uh, film. It was a psychological thriller. And John was a colleague of Dan Donnelly's and he had seen the film and ran into me on set making another film called Werewolf in a Women's Prison. And um, he came to the set of Werewolf in a Women's Prison and said, Hey, Victoria, I saw you in Shadows. And uh, and you were so good. That character was so good. Like, oh, my God. Like, you were so good. And I was like, oh, wow. Did, did he th I guess he thought I sucked before. And now he like, saw that and was like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, she is kind of good. I, I liked what you did there. And I was like, oh, I'm like, great. I'm like, awesome. And then shortly after, um, shortly after, I guess it was we're off in a women's prison. Um, John had contacted me about um, his production bio slime and this crazy um, slime creature that he wanted to do. Um, and that she was, you know, and the goo goo or slime monster embodied anyone who um, they, it attacked. 
but it was when it was attacking women, like you'd be naked and you'd actually become this monster and be like in the beast of the, uh, the belly of the beast of the monster and like become this monster, but like, you're going to be naked. And I was like, this sounds great. You know how much, you know, <laughs> um, I started doing nudity very early on in my career, uh, uh, basically because it paid more. You know, I was just like, how much is that? All right. You know, I was like, all right, I got to work out and I don't want to embarrass myself being, you know, gro- looking gross on camera unless that's the requirement of the character. But I was like, cool, you know, um, uh-huh. I'll do it. And, um, it was just so much fun working with John. Um, we shot that production like in a whirlwind, and um I, I just I just remember being like like him like really striking me and like very early on John the Chaco became like one of my favorite filmmakers that I was working with. Um and I just couldn't believe that I had met him like on set and then a few years later here I am starring in one of his films. And um and then like when when he got the opportunity to bring back the Killjoy series, which there hadn't been, there was the first two films in 2000 and 2002, and there hadn't been a film in quite some time. And they wanted to revive that series. Full Moon likes to keep their series going because they have, you know, such an epic worldwide following. And um, so when John Lechago got that job, I just thought, cool for him. I, I didn't even think anything of it. I was like, wow, Full Moon's awesome. You know, they have decades worth of followers. And, you know, this is so great. How good for, for him. And then I was communicating with Jeff Leroy, who was um, the co-writer and director of Wolf in a Woman's Prison, who was a colleague of John's and had read the script, the, the first draft of the script that um, that the CEO, Charles Bam, was still sitting with and, and that was kind of um, floating around uh, Full Moon Features. And Jeff had, uh, or John had sent it to Jeff to, to get his opinion. Um, and as, you know, colleague filmmakers do, and I had spoken to Jeff at that time, and I was like, what is the script like? What is this new Killjoy like? Um, and because I remember the first one, I wasn't a real big fan of the second one. And then I it kind of seemed like the series kind of died. And um, and I said, you know, there's a rumor that there might be a, a, a role in this for me. And Jeff was like, oh, I know exactly who it is. And I was like, really? And I was like, who? And he's like, it's got to be Batty Boop. And I was like, who? Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> what like, is a Batty Boop? <laughs> right like what like what like oh is it a play on betty boop and the whole thing and he was like you just got to read the script and i was like all right well i have to wait for john so then john finally contacts me and was like victoria i wrote this role in in my like with you in mind and um but i have a lot of like um i have a lot of ideas and you know i really want to sit down and talk about this um to you you know can i send you the script and you know i i, I wrote betty boop with you in mind i was like oh cool and i read it and I knew immediately what he was what he was going for. And then I was like, okay, how do you want to do this? And he was like, well, here's the thing. Um, since she's a succubus, I want to use my art degree because John actually has a fine art degree. He's an incredible artist. Um, and I want to design her look to be just body makeup. <laughs> And I was like, really? Okay. And he's like, yeah, like, I really, like, I want to paint you down, like, full body, like, makeup. And, like, that's it. Like, we're going to put some prosthetics on you. But um, essentially, you're going to be painted fully nude every day. Are you cool with that? And I was like, yeah. You know, again, and how much? (laughs) What's the day rate again? And then, um, so we got together with Tom Devlin, and we did some makeup tests. And um, I just loved it. I just loved what they were doing. And I was like, man, I got to work the fuck out because it is not going to play if I have a big fat gut or, you know, big fat cheesy thighs and with this character like that. Her the paint was essentially her skin, her body. So I was like, OK, and you kind of have to forget that you're fully nude. And that's just that's who Batty is. And um, so I was like, OK, you're going to be in a room of, you know, 20 to 30 people fully naked every day. OK, and no cell phones on set, please. You know, um, <laughs> And, like, just the whole process of, like, um, how is this going to fit in, like, to the story? And he's like, she's a badass. I want to, uh, she needs to sound a certain way, you know, come up with an accent. It could be something New York. It could be something, you know, British or Cockney. You could create something. Like, she needs to sound a certain way. I want that to really be the distinction that sets Batty apart. And I was like, oh, God, okay, accent, you know, come up with something. And then, okay, full body paint, got to work out. Okay, and then he was like, and I also want to utilize your experience as a professional dancer. John always loved that about me. He loves dance and dancers. And he said, so she's got to move a certain way. Um, you know, she's got to saunter and sachet and kind of her movement kind of has to be a, 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 a kind of a rhythmic kind of um 
d- dance almost, but not dancing. Well, I don't want her to dance. And I was like, all right, got it. You know, I just got to go. Okay, movement, you know, behavior. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So like, I was like, whoa, I had all these notes. And then I basically rewrote the script um, of, of my portion of it um, in the batty language that I had created. Um, which I actually created from a friend of mine who was helping me move at the time who was from Staten Island, but had lived in Los Angeles uh, for about 25 years at the time. But his fucking accent from Staten Island was so thick. It almost sounded like he, he was speak, He was from a different country. And like he, the English yeah. wasn't his first language. And I remember going, dude, like after he moved me, I was like, dude, can I take you out and buy you dinner and a beer and record our conversation? I want to record your voice because I'm working on a character for a movie and I've got an idea here with what you got going on. He was like, oh, yeah, no problem. So we did that. And and I took those tapes and his voice and with that, with the combination and the tonality Actually, the way that I speak to my cat. I was going <laughs> to so say, it's, use, yeah, it's definitely there's like it's like a New know? York slash baby talk almost. With like, exactly. <laughs> so it was like the combination of my buddy from Staten Island plus the way I speak to my ki- beloved kitty cat. Plus just creating kind of your own kind of alphabet. So I created my own batty alphabet and I rewrote the entire script, all the dialogue, every word and syllable that I said in the phonetic batty language and then memorized it that way in case there were multiple films I could duplicate this accent or this voice or this sound um and john just have to absolutely loved it he went ape shit for it um and i you know i you had to rewrite everything where it was like it sounded like two eyes here or the consonants over here and it was all you know basically it hardly looked like english but i i had there was a method to my madness <laughs> so yeah definitely it's definitely a, we finally- was a strange thing especially if i'm like why is this happening but yeah, and then, like, I didn't even, like, I had been, pr- I practiced the shit out of it in my home to my cat, you know what I mean? Like, not in front of anybody or anything. So, like, when we got to China and we were shooting Killjoy 3 or Killjoy's Revenge, when we were stepping onto set the first day, like, when the transportation came to pick us all up, I had a pre-call because it took five and a half hours to get into that makeup. So, the makeup department, John Machago and myself, of course, had a major pre-call at about 4.45 in the morning. Um, to get me ready to get on set by about 10, 15, 10, 30. So I, and I remember like John was in the car when they came to, pick, they picked him up first and they came to my hotel and I got on, when I woke up that I couldn't sleep the night before and I was so sick to my stomach, like all night, all morning. And then I get into the car and he's like, Victoria, good morning. And I was like, John, and just like hysterical <laughs> crying, like a nervous breakdown right there. Like at 4.45 in the morning, or like 4.30, they were picking us up. Hysterical crying. I'm like, I threw up this morning. I'm so sick to my stomach. And I don't know what to do. And I'm shaking and breaking out my eyes. And I don't oh, know no. if I can do this. And I like completely lost my mind. He was like, oh my God. So they threw me into my dressing room, which had to be big enough to incorporate the makeup department that was doing me because I couldn't be in the makeup room with the other actors because we needed the privacy for how I was being painted and made up and I just wanted to like live in like my dressing room the whole time. So after I got ready and I stepped onto set, I was so nervous. I was like shaking. Um, I kept having to run to the bathroom. I mean, I was so sick to my stomach. I was shaking. And then when um, when he yelled action and that first day, um, I think the first scene that we were shooting on my first day is in Killjoy 3, where my character is seducing the young stud. Um, and the scene starts with my reveal and I say, booyah, and I start, um, I start. And booyah wasn't in the script. I had added that. That was Batty's voice. And John's not too cool about adding things, but he liked that. So um, we shot that first scene. Um, what a lot of people actually don't know is my performance as Batty Boop and all three of those films was basically one take because I had worked so hard on this character for so long and was so ready having <laughs> done performed it in front of my cat for so long that when the camera was rolling, like there were there, we didn't need another take. Like I nailed it in the way that John wanted it, you know, every time. Cause I was just so prepared, probably over overly prepared. Um, so I, and I remember, you know, you remember when you're shooting, how many takes you're doing and what take is actually ending up. And, you know, when you're only doing one or two takes, you know, you know, what's ending up, we didn't have the yeah. time for a lot of takes and, 
John was just so goddamn happy that I was so prepared and that I was so on that when we got Victoria in front of the camera, we could actually catch up on our day because she's going to be so on it. We're, we're going to, you know, she's going to nail it. We're going to move right through. But I was so horribly nervous. I really felt like I was going to die. But once it's, once it started, I just, you know, she just, she, you know, she just burst right there on camera, right in front of everyone. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, yeah. At least she didn't burst out with the booyah and start crying. So that's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I, I read that, like, essentially, I mean, I know you said it was just what you basically got most of it done in one take, but like when you, obviously it's huge that he wrote that for you, but when you took it, did you realize you were going to be like working 19 hour days with and not being able to sit down because your paint would rub off and like that had to be a pretty hectic, uh, a hectic day for you anytime you had to do that. It was because, um, yeah, like I was working about seven and a half hours just in makeup. Um, it was about five and a half hours or almost eight hours, about five and a half hours to get it on. It was about two and a half hours to get it, to get it out. So it was really about an eight hour day of just makeup and then, oh. you know, shooting 12 hours in between that. Um, it was very hard. I was, I was literally only getting a couple hours of sleep. I was so amped and I would just like, I, I needed transportation during that time because I just, I, I couldn't focus, especially when we were shooting the fourth and fifth film in, in Los Angeles. I couldn't deal, of course, I had transportation when we were shooting in China, but I couldn't deal with the traffic. And L.A. traffic is, you know, well, that's where road rage begins. I mean, it'll give you a stroke. It's so bad. Yeah. So I couldn't deal with that. So I had to have people picking me up and, and dropping me off, you know, a, a really nice production assistant that would just, that would deal with <laughs> me and my madness. And like in the morning, I would just want to hear the Natural Born Killers soundtrack produced by Trent Reznor from the Oliver Stone film, like all morning. Just put it, you know, on repeat in the car, so we'd hear all the way to the <laughs> studio, and then I'd have to have that playing in my dressing room all day. And we were getting ready, and people in the production either really became fans of that <laughs> soundtrack or really hated it. Um, and then lunch was the only time I could sit down. I would lay down. I either had a couch in my dressing room or I would just bring my, my yoga mat and just lay down on the floor and roll around for my 30 minute lunch break because I couldn't sit down. I it would mess up the makeup. And so that angst of standing for five and a half hours and then you're shooting for a few hours before lunch and you, you know, you're, you, you will start moving in a certain way when you can't sit down at all and you're naked, you know, yeah. for all that time. Um, Death so then I, I rolled around. <laughs> the whole thing's crazy. Yeah. You have to spend all this time doing makeup just to be naked all day. Right. And then <laughs> so I'm rolling around on the floor and trying to stretch and like lay down during like lunch where I'm not wanting to eat that much because I don't want to have this big fat bloated stomach, you know, with the rest of the thing. Because she, I mean, a lot of people, including the CEO after the first film, thought I was wearing a suit. Many people still argue from seeing Killjoy 3, even into Killjoy 4, Killjoy Go which is Killjoy Goes to Hell, that I'm wearing a suit. And I'm and I'm going to I'm going to go on the record one more time here, Paul, on your show and say I was not wearing a suit in that character at all ever robin sydney who played luann who was the faux baddie and baddie imposter wore a leotard and suit because she was not able to do the nudity but baddie boop what that was her baddie boop skin was colorful like that and that was baddie's body on victoria's body there was no suit involved trust me <laughs> that's crazy it's... And then, like, when they drive me home at the end of the night, I was so exhausted. I just cried hysterically in the car all the way home. And, like, the assistant would be like, are you okay? Do you want to talk? Or just... I'm just like, no, just let me scream and cry back here. Just ignore me. Turn up the radio or whatever you need to do. But, you know, whatever. Just let me cry. Just ignore me. Because I was like, uh, what am I doing? Like, this is either going to go down in history as, like, the worst performance. I'm going to be the worst actress known ever of all times. Or this is going to become, like, an iconic thing. And thank God it became an iconic thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I couldn't even imagine if that would have went wrong. Like, I'm naked. I'm talking weird. I'm painted. And everyone hates it. Thank God they didn't, yeah. Um, I mean, like, and then I'd get home and, like, only had a few hours to sleep work out and prep for the next day so you know i was sleeping like like i would come home and i need to unwind a little bit and then i'd be like okay i need to get in to, to i need to get you know still like i just got out of the character but i need to get back in it to kind of prep it or whatever and so i'm like okay i gotta work out because i don't want to be fat so i work out to get my energy up and then okay so then i'm prepping for the next day like really really quick and then i'm falling asleep and then the next thing you know about an hour hour and 20 minutes later and eh, my alarm's going off and i need to get throw just throw myself in the shower because my my driver's coming to pick me up and you know 
20 minutes. <laughs> That's I think dedication. Before the sun's even up. <laughs> At 4.30 in the morning. So it was like, yeah, it was pretty, um, it was pretty challenging. <laughs> so when, uh, when Killjoy 3 came out, was it, did you notice immediately that people were reacting to that character in a positive way or was it, did it, yeah. did it take some time? I was or? like, I was like, oh man, they liked it. Phew. I was like the majority. <laughs> I mean, there's always going to be haters that are like, these movies suck. These oh, people sure. suck, you know, and that's fine. There's some people that just dump on everything and that's fine. That's them. That has nothing to do with us. That's them. Anybody out there is listening. If anybody's ever dumping on your shit, it's them. It's their issues. It's not you and your shit. So just remember that. But um, you, you kind of have, have to have a, a thick skin in this business, thicker than you could possibly imagine. And you also have to turn a deaf ear to a lot of things. But um, I was just so grateful that the majority of people responded to it and liked it. And I had friends who were seeing it, like, on airplanes who watched the movie and, like, didn't realize it was me and then liked that character and watched the credits at the end and was like, holy shit, that was Victoria. What? And I'm like, didn't you see my name in the beginning? And you know, it's like a lot of people don't watch that stuff. So they're like, no, I didn't, you know, I don't watch, I don't, the credits, I don't you know, care. I'm just there to watch the movie. But then at the end, if they like a song or like, like they like a performance, they'll like check it out in the credits at the end. So I got a lot of people responding to me going, I didn't even know that was fucking you. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm a bona fide character actor now if people didn't even recognize me in that role. And when I saw the final cut and how it came together, I, I, I was actually really impressed by myself that what I had done w- came through and, and I, I pulled it off. <laughs> That's awesome. No, absolutely. And uh, I'm sure none of you could imagine that, you know, obviously now like, Batty Boop and Killjoy both have become pretty iconic characters. You you got your action figure doll now. You're in comic books. They made two more sequels. Um, so I mean, yes. congratulations on all of that for sure. Was Thank was you. doing uh, Goes to Hell a lot more? Uh, you, were you in less tears the second time around? No, I was even more stressed out, believe it or not, because I was like, oh, my God, I have to do that again. Like, what if it's not as good the second time? Like, you know, that took me so much to do um, what I did in in Killjoy 3. And she was the female lead, but still she had more scenes in Killjoy Goes to Hell than she even did in Killjoy 3. So I was like, oh, fuck, like, this is great. We're doing another one. I was really happy, you know, and I love her. I love Bunny Boop. I worship her. I'm eternally grateful to her. But. I, I was I was terrified. I was like, oh, my God, talk about being sick. I got so upset and sick one day, which a lot of people don't know about this. I freaked out so hardcore in my dressing room after it was about six hours that day. It was taken, taken us to get me ready. And um, there was a variety of artists who worked on me at the time. Like in in China, there was three or four people working me at uh, working on me at the time. And then there started as the film started to progress. It was two people. It was three people. It was two people. And then it was one person. When we did mm-hmm. the final film, Kill, Kill, Kill Psycho Circus, that was actually one artist that got me into all that in the same amount of time too, five and a half hours. So that artist is absolutely amazing. Um, that that she was able to do that um and she petitioned so hardcore that she could do it and she was right she absolutely did it and her name is is felicia and i love her um but in this oh my god we were it was one day on killjoy goes to hell i just freaked out and it and i i it was kind of sleep deprivation kicking in i i really had slept like less than an hour um like the night before and it took about six hours to get me into it and i i i started to get really sick to my stomach and And they were starting to call me on set and I started to just have what I think was just a massive panic attack because my my chest started to seize up and I'm getting shooting pains down in my left arm and I'm sick to my stomach and my vision is blurry and being compromised. and I'm starting to feel like I can't hear right, like I'm in a like a jar or something and I I can't hear right. Like I can hear voices and sounds, but there's something like felt, felt like it was blocking it. And I really started to fucking freak out and they tried to get me like some like seven up for my tummy and they started to like to get me like electrolytes with like all the Gatorade and stuff like that. So I was probably dehydrated. Um, and then when I started to tell John that my vision was blurry and I'm getting shooting arm uh, pains in my left arm and in my chest, um, John Lachago is a survivor of a heart attack. And, um, uh, thank God. And he thought I was going into cardiac arrest and was like, stop, you're going to the hospital. So I actually ended up going to the oh, hospital wow. that day. 
and I didn't end up shooting. So they had to shoot around me and then I had to come back uh, the next day and, and do it again. I, 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 I think it was just dehydration, exhaustion, and just severe pressure I was putting on myself. But, um, intolerable pressure that I was putting on myself. I think uh, oftentimes we are our worst critics and we're hardest on ourselves, but, um, I, I survived (laughs) and we went back and shot (laughs) and I think my, thank you. So no heart attack or nothing. It was just, I mean, no, it was just, it was a massive panic attack. Um, I had, I had had one of those before working on another film, um, with Joey Buttafuoco, which was the actual real Joe, Joey Buttafuoco back from the, um, the Long Island Lolita uh, tragedy that happened. The guy who had an affair with that young girl who, who shot his wife. Oh, um, wow. he, we did a film together several years ago and I got really stressed out, uh, a night before working, um, with him, which he, he was a nice guy in person, but, um, but a terrible actor and a terrible professional on set. He didn't know one word, let alone any of his lines. It was, it was hell, but I got really stressed out the night before going to work with him, which I had a panic attack. And I was so severe. I went to the hospital and they told me it was a condition called costochondritis, which is, um, brought on by extreme emotional, uh, distress or stress. And um, a severe panic attack can also trigger that, which is also brought on by the same things. And what that does is it simulates the symptoms of cardiac arrest. So you think you're, go- you're having a heart attack, but you're not. And so th- once that happens, unfortunately, when costochondritis, it's a chronic condition. So if you ever have another severely emotional attack uh, or panic attack, it'll it'll induce it again. So that's kind of what I was going through. And it's when the cartilage in between your ribs swells so much that it presses on your heart and your chest and you, it, the, the tightness makes you feel like you're you're having a heart attack. But um, no, it was just wow. a panic attack. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, think, well, think, I mean, not that that's a good thing, but thank God it wasn't anything worse or, you know, a heart attack or anything. But, yeah, wow. Yeah, that would have been bad. Um, having a heart attack in your 30s is a sign to slow down. Um, John Lechago, fortunately, had experienced that, and he thought that that's what I was experiencing at, at the time. So, yeah, if you're if you're getting so stressed out, you're having panic attacks that are leading to cardiac arrest, you're going through cardiac arrest, or you're having a mini stroke or something, and you're in your 30s, you guys, it means you got to slow it down. What did you say <laughs> that was called again? That, what did you say? Costochondritis is an extreme... It costochondritis, yeah, it's an extreme case of uh, of a panic attack. Wow, that's it's pretty bad. It's pretty scary. Like when the ambulance w- came to get me, like the first time that it hit me, um, they were talking to me, and you know, when the paramedics show up, they address you right away to see if you're responsive and you know, vocally or how you respond if you respond at all. And of course, I was sitting there wide eyed, and they were like, "Ma'am, can you hear us?" what's your name? Can you tell us your name? And I was just, and I could hear them, but I couldn't, I could hear the words. I could hear everything that was going on, but I couldn't physically move my mouth to say, yes, my name is Victoria. I couldn't say any, and I was frozen up like a, like a rock, like rigor mortis had set in where they had to like scoop me up, put me on the stretcher and like spread me out kind of like a cartoon, like pushing me down or whatever. And I just remember losing it in the ambulance going, am I going to die? Am I going to (laughs) die? Just tell me right now, am I going to die? And they were like, you're not going to die. Just hold on. We're taking you to the hospital. This is horrible. Jesus. Well, thank God. (laughs) Holy cow. Well, we're glad. Everyone's glad you made it back. And hopefully, (laughs) hopefully you you try to stay a little more relaxed now or do whatever they told you to do to to hopefully not have that happen to you again. Yeah, you know, they tell you to relax and take time off, take a couple weeks off. And I'm like, I can't take time off. I can't tell Well, take time off from what? And they're like, well, you know, just can't you just, you know, take some time off from work, like take your vacation and can't take some sick time from work. And I'm like, no, man, I'm an actor. I'm an artist. I perpetually freelance. Like not when you're telling me I can't work, then then I can't pay my bills. Like, what are you talking about? Two weeks. Like I I freaked out. I was like, no, I can't take two weeks off. And I think I rested for three or four days. But then I was back in it because I was like, "I I can't take two weeks off. Yeah. I, you know, it's like you take two weeks off from your job, you're getting your sick pay or your vacation pay. And, you know, I don't work for a corporation like that. You know, I'm I'm a freelancer, so I can't take time off. What are you like me? Yeah, you guys are making it worse. <laughs> you're making me stress more. I know. I was like, what? They're like, you can't work out. You can't work. You got to rub. I was like, what? You know, it's like the things that I do all the time. I work and I work out all the time. That's all yeah. I do. You know, SAG doesn't pay me to stay home. Jesus, come on. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's crazy. It's only great when you get your residuals when you're like, yes, I had a bill <laughs> coming up that I didn't know how I was going to pay. I was going to pull it out of my ass somehow or take it off a credit card and do the whole switcheroo thing. And then you get that residual check in the mail and you're like, I love you, Scarlet Actor Skills. <laughs> you <laughs> saved me. <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> Jesus to the rescue. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um. So I definitely want to talk more about uh, this, uh, like Patty Boop and the stuff you have upcoming. But you're also a musician and a vocalist, so I don't, I don't want to, I want, to, I want to talk about that a little bit. You've been doing that. Like, when did that start for you? Putting out, I, I don't, you put out several records. Um, Thank you. Was that was that something you started back when you were still in New York? Is that something you've always dreamed of doing? Like, how did you get started into the in the music world? You know, like secretly as a kid, I always used to like perform all my favorite artists in my room as a little girl and pretend they were my songs, like George Michael songs, Madonna songs, and Prince and Michael Jackson. Of course, I'm dating myself in the 80s, but I did that um, when I was a little girl as well. Yeah, man, I love (laughs) pop music in the 80s was the shit, man. And I grew up on that. And um, I used to just, I had the secret fantasy, um, you know, that I was an artist and that um, all these songs were my songs. So I'd sing them and perform them like they were my songs. But I never believed, it was another thing of believing, I never believed that I was a songwriter or could write songs. I didn't believe that that was something that I could do. So that was kind of like a secret desire and passion of mine. Um, But I didn't have 100% belief in it. I didn't have 100% belief in myself. Um, Until I got into college and I started to audition and perform um, with like cover bands just for fun. Uh, in New York. And I remember when I first started to express that to certain family members and stuff, uh, so sometimes it's unfortunate how the closest people to you can actually discourage you from what you really want to do. It's unfortunate, but I remember expressing that to some of my family members about how I was um, at audition for this cover band and I was going to be the lead front man um, singing, uh, lead singer of this this new cover band. And I was really excited and they were doing, um, you know, rock songs, like classic rock, and heart and um, Janice and you know all but some really good shit and and you know they hired me and I remember some family members like laughing at me like what you're oh, you're gonna be a lead singer in a band like no you're not like <laughs> you're gonna sing rock like well you can sing but you sing more like Mariah Carey and shit and like, like how are you gonna do that like on, like in a rock band and we just they just dumped I mean they just took a diarrhea dump all over oh, I was so excited that That's I was this. gonna be doing which sucked. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm not telling you fuckers anything more about what I'm doing with music. Because anything with dance or performance, they were all about it. But, you know, you deviate from, you, you change your picture from the snapshot picture that everyone, especially members of your family, have for you. And it's almost like they can't deal with it because they're invested their time and energy into the snapshot that they have of you. And then if you change, you're like, well, who is this? They can't, they almost like can't adapt to it. So they didn't adapt to me becoming a vocalist. So I was like, well, fuck you. I'm going to do it anyway because I love to sing. Um, I just was in and out of cover bands, like in New York and in LA and even like some original bands in LA, just, you know, front being the front man and the front or the woman, whatever, the lead singer and, uh, backup singer and, you know, backup singer and dancer and just a backup dancer for some groups and just a backup singer for others and both and leads here and there. And like every band breaks up, man, they just do every motherfucking band breaks up. There's conflict, there's problems. People want to start solo careers. There's disagreements and artistic vision. There's business feuds. It's just everything that could possibly go wrong with the band will go wrong. And I just decided I was never going to break up with myself. Um, I just um, started working with, I had an opportunity where I was in um, a magazine called Girls and Corpses Magazine, and I believe it was a spread about um, We're Off in a Woman's Prison, this crazy comedy, horror comedy that I did with Jeff Leroy, and um, the publisher really liked me, and we had a nice meeting, and he did a really nice interview and um, article and pictorial in his magazine, and was doing a signing one day. Um, at a bookstore and invited me to come and sign. And I was also very excited because Bill Mosley and a couple other people, Sid Haig and whatnot, a couple of the people I really admired were in the magazine and articles too. So I thought, oh, holy shit, this is awesome. And um, when I was at that signing, I didn't know that the publisher um, uh, and editor-in-chief, Robert Ryan, was a close colleague of Kim Fowley, who was a legendary producer and songwriter from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, who had uh, founded the Runaways, um, that uh, all-girl punk rock group oh, yeah. um, in the 70s with uh, Joan Jett and Cherie Cree. 
um, Lita Ford, um, and whatnot. And uh, he wrote songs with Kiss and Alice Cooper and Motley Crue. And I mean, everybody that you could possibly think of in that time, um, was a, was a real kind of iconic guy. And I knew who he was at the time when I met him and I was just like, Oh my God. And when he first met me, he asked me, um, do you sing? And, um, and I was like, yes. And, um, and then, and he was like, I figured. And then he asked me the second question was, do you like cats? And I was like, Yes, and I thought that was a weird, weird, odd question. And he was like, "Do you like have the a cat?" Animal and I was or the like, musical, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he was like, "Do you have a cat?" And I was like, "Yeah, I do." And then I was kind of, I was kind of thinking to myself, "Where the fuck is this going? Like, this is like really weird or whatever." And then, like, that was the end of that conversation and whatnot. And then the next day, <laughs> that was the I end get of a the phone call. What the fuck? Yeah, he was all like, "Do you sing? Yeah. Do you like cats? Yeah. Do you have a cat?" Yeah. Cool. Okay. And then I was like, nice to meet you. And he like walked away or whatever. And I was like, what the fuck was that? It was really weird. So then like the next day, literally, I get a call from him. He's like, hi, this is Kim Fowley calling. And I was like, what? And he was like, we met yesterday at Robert Ryan's uh, uh, magazine signing. Um, you, this is Victoria DeMar, right? And I was like, yes, we met yesterday. And I was like, yes. He said, Robert gave me your contact information. I go, oh, okay. And he said, um... They're making a movie about my life called um, The Runaways, or or I guess they called it Cherry Bomb or some shit like that. I can't remember what they called it. It might have been The Runaways. And um, he said, Michael, Academy Award nominee Michael Shannon is playing me. Do you know who he is? And I said, yeah, I know who he is. Um, he said, Kristen Stewart is playing um, uh, Joan Jett, and Dakota Fanning is playing Cherie Cree. Do you know who they are? And I said, yes, I know who they are. And he goes, yeah, well, this is going to be my resurgence in the 20th century. And um, so I'm starting a new Runaways. And um, it's going to be an all-girl uh, punk rock group. It's not going to be four or five members this time, though. It's going to be nine or ten. And uh, I was thinking I'd like you to be the lead singer. And I was like, what? <laughs> are, you, are you serious? Yeah. And he was like, yes. And I mean, I had an audition for him. I hadn't sing a note, nothing. You know, it was a, not, not a thing. And he, was, he said, are you interested? And I said, yes, absolutely. And he said, okay, be here. Here's the recording studio. Here's the address at noon. Um, you'll be paid in full for every song that you sing on, um, any song that you write. You'll be paid at the end of the day with a check when you walk out the door, and I'll buy you. I'll buy you lunch too. And I was like, "It's fucking awesome!" What? You know, again, I was like, "I need." You know, somehow, somehow, this money just comes out of the woodwork. Sometimes, I just think I'm asking the universe for it all the time, and sometimes it just rears its head right when you need it. And so I was like, "Oh my god!" And went to the recording session and met all these other amazing girls and musicians. And um, the group is called Black Room Doom. We cut one album, one studio album. Uh, which unfortunately was never released because the band broke up because of course all the girls wanted to start their own different solo projects and already had other solo projects and bands and groups they were working with and it you know nine girls getting together and forming a punk rock group <laughs> like yeah right it was a constant cat fight so um after that it died in in flames That's um crazy. kim had approached I know Kim had approached me of doing about doing a solo career and I said absolutely so we started working on a solo career together um the first album of mine he produced was called Actress and it was a 14 track album it was mostly pop rock um that I I had co-written most of the songs with him on um and performed all the songs but um the album came and went in like 2011 um, and, uh, and then of course, Kim Belly and I had a, uh, falling out and decided to go, um, our separate ways. And so I, I produced and wrote and distributed myself. It's actually still available as a limited edition CD. Um, my first debut solo album, which was just called Victoria DeMar, which was a 12 track pop rock album. Um, and then I had a really nice response to it and had some radio stations like FM radio stations in New York and New Jersey playing it. Um, K Rock in LA was playing one of my songs um, on Ronnie Binger, Bingenheimer's show, um, so I, I was like, "This is awesome!" And suddenly got airplay in like at least twelve countries, like worldwide. Um, I, South America really took off. People were really loving uh, what I was doing, so I just decided that um, I, I didn't wasn't going to fit in anybody's box. You know, when you it's great to work with other collaborative producers, but when you're working with an executive producer who's funding your entire project, you know, and the person who holds the money has holds the power so they kind of get the final say because it's their dime you know which makes sense and I just decided that I wasn't I didn't want to work that way anymore um, anymore independently unless I was signed to 
of course, a major company, that would be a different situation. And I just got sick of people start, trying to put me in a certain box. Like Fowley was always trying to make me this certain artist that he thought that I needed to be. And like when we met, I was already in like my early 30s. So it was like or almost mid 30s at the time. And I was like, dude, you know, I know that you like work with all these young girls, you know, eight, 17, 18, 19 year old girls or 23 year old girls and stuff like that who really haven't had a career, or haven't had anything artistically significant yet. But like you're working with a woman in her 30s, man, I have I have a whole fucking career of decades like behind me. And he was trying to like, make me be this thing that he wanted me to be. And I was Life just like, experience. fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, fuck you, dude. I'm going to be who I want to be. And Kim Feli and I were both very, very strong personalities, which worked really well together when we agreed. But when we didn't agree, it was World War III. So it was just best that we parted our separate ways, and I was just able to just fund and produce my own shit. If you're going to be an indie artist, you might as well just fund and produce your own shit so no one is trying to tell you what to do because it's their money. Absolutely. So... So with that, I I didn't I didn't know that. That's all. That's crazy to me. That's that's insane. Especially the whole the new Runaway thing, which that's a pretty good movie. I, I didn't I liked the movie. <laughs> I thought it was a great movie. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was a great movie. It was really well done. So I guess with with all that, and then you were like, okay, I'm gonna just be me now because your last two albums that came out are <laughs> are not pop princess. Uh, Albums. <laughs> Hashtag I'm plot not and fuck you are the are the latest releases. That's it. <laughs> The third and fourth albums were hashtag fraud and fuck you. But even with that, it's funny because with that, with what the story you just told me, it was almost like you did become the new runaway. You're like, fuck this, I'm gonna go be a punk rock princess instead of your little pop. Yeah. Star. So that's- I love the fact when you're doing your own project that like. Um, and, and I really got, I mean, my second album, which was actually my first digital album, which was Can You Not Tell, was a 14 track album. And there were some songs from my first album that I put on the second album because the first album was never released digitally. So there were only some tracks put up on SoundCloud you could stream for free. So I thought, and Can You Not Tell, I was going to add some of my favorite songs from that album and put it on there. But it was really mostly still, you know, pop, pop rock driven. So with the third album, I was just like, I decided that I wanted to write and produce uh, an, one album for, for one person. So every single one of those songs on Hashtag Twat was written for the same person. And that's kind of how that project started. And that person is a twat. That's why I was calling it Hashtag Twat. And I just thought, I, you know, there's so many different emotions of I love you, I hate you, I wish you would die, and, you know, I can't live without you kind of thing that happens in in a romantic relationship and so i thought i was going to capitalize on that and just go with my innate feeling about music which is i love all music i i can't define one genre of music that i only like and only listen to i mean i i like to unwind to beethoven i mean i love classical music i love beethoven he's my favorite composer um i you know i love punk rock music you know i do like pop music there is some country music i do like i do like hardcore like speed metal and hard rock i just i love music in general i feel that music is the only art that can really bring the world together as as a global community is is through music whether you speak the language or not you get the feeling from the music and from the words and everybody can identify even if you're from a totally different country or culture. So I thought I'm going to combine nine different genres of music. I'm going to put hard rock with rap, with dance, with pop, with punk rock, with country. I'm going to mix this bitch up. And so I released Tag Side Twat and so many people really responded amazingly to it and we're like this is awesome so i was like i'm gonna go with this so when i decided to produce fuck you it was really just the culmination of fuck you hollywood fuck you you know who do you say i hate the whole bullshit when you get into the music industry is just such a factory the music industry especially pop music i i understand the pop performers they all that's the most popular genre and they all make the most money and that's where they even if you start in one genre like taylor swift sorry in country she crossed over into pop like even post malone started in rap and hip-hop he's crossed into pop they all do it right so i was like well fuck that who where's the artist that does it all Where's the artist that does country, that does rap, that does dance, that does pop, that does punk rock, that does, you know, uh, jazz? I threw, I threw jazz tracks in there. I thought, 
where's the artist that does it all on the stage all at the same time? And I was like, well, the artist is right here. That artist is Victoria DeMar because there is no artist like that in music history that does it all. And I was like, I'm going to be the one that does yeah. it all. So with fuck you, I was like, fuck you to Hollywood. Fuck you to the music industry. Who do I fucking sound like? I sound like fucking Victoria DeMar, bitch. And that's exactly who I want to sound like. So fuck you, you know, fuck you to uh. some pop artists that I can't stand that are thieves and stuff like that. Cause you know, I have this song on fuck you called is that art where I, talk about um money lies still suck and fuck anything here just to make a buck that's real hollywood um and it is and it's hollywood is just a horrible place <laughs> it's a horrible horrible place and so i thought i'm just going to incorporate like all that and fuck you to the naysayers who thought that i couldn't sing and fuck you to the i put an acapella track on there which is just me in the booth and my page you can hear me turning the page of my book and fuck you to the people who say you have to only do one genre and you only have to sound like this. And fuck you to the people who thought I couldn't write music or produce music. And so, like, fuck you just became this, like, awesome – and fuck you that you can't combine genres and just fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You know what I mean? Yes. And I was like, I'm calling this album Fuck You. And actually, when I was creating it, it was a joke that I had written down, like, you know, like, the working title, like, fuck you. And I was having a conversation with someone on the phone that pissed me off. So I wrote down, well, fuck you and then i decided that's the title that's it so that's, that's a 12 awesome. track album and it actually combines 10 different genres on this one so it's it's only a 37 minute approximately 37 minute maybe 20 some seconds or 30 some seconds or so so it, it put it on and listen to it i've had some fans message me and say they play it at work in their office and people have commented like what is this that you're listening to is this pandora is this a mix, a playlist on Spotify? Like, what is this? And people spreading the word that, no, this is Victoria DeMar, and she that's all her. And people saying, that's the same girl, that's the same artist. And, yeah, that's the same artist, the same girl, it's the same record, actually. Um, so I really love people's response on that because um, I, I, I feel – when when fans are feeling the same way that you felt when you were creating it, then I feel like that that's a success. Absolutely. No, that's so awesome. Like – you're going. On, I'm. I'm sitting over here like stepbrothers. Like, oh my god, we just became best friends. But because uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But yeah, the album that uh, fuck you and hashtag twat and uh, Jesus, what's the other? One? I already forgot. Can you can you not tell? Are all uh, available on streaming services? You can get them on Spotify and anywhere else. You can go check check all that music out as well. Um, and I definitely wanted to. I don't know, give you a nod or just let people know, like, so obviously with a title like Fuck You and people, you know, the mainstream not, uh, you know, taking something like that, you've actually had pretty good success with the records, like, even just being featured in films, which a lot of artists can't even do, is that, is that kind of helped you with being in both, uh, both lanes there to get, uh, placement and stuff like that? Because I know you've been featured in a few, uh, few films, including a new one with, uh, with Tara Reid and Richard Grieco from, uh good old 21 jump street days yes i was so thrilled i um i i was initially um approached about putting um some songs in music which i was so thrilled because initially um when i started writing music i was really when i started writing music with kim fowley we were writing music for films for placement in films and it was all about the process of getting together with the director and finding out um what songs they needed and what the feel was and what the scene was and what the actors were doing and um so so that's kind of really how i started writing music so when i actually started getting placements um i was thrilled because it was beyond you know a dream of mine like i said success in music was always a secret desire of mine so um I was just beyond thrilled. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I just absolutely couldn't believe it. I, I had, um, I'm a film collector and a film fan, so I have tons of DVDs and Blu-rays and VHS and everything. And um, um, I like to buy and collect everything and watch everything. I generally watch a film or two a day just as my unwind time. I don't watch television um, at all. I find commercial television to be very depressing, and they're all just trying to sell you something, make you buy something, and make you feel bad about that the fact that you're not that person on TV. So I don't watch TV, but I do watch films. Um, again, I watch a film or two a day just to unwind my unwind downtime. And I remember watching, like, I had wanted the Twilight uh, series or whatever on DVD because I'm a collector and I like to get, you know, the full series of things. I have all the the Lord of the Rings and all the Hobbits and all the, you know, the Underworld series. I have all those. Like, I, when it's a series, I like to get, you know, I like to get those. I like to collect those. And I remember watching 
the first Twilight and Robert Pattinson has a lot of songs in the first Twilight, which a lot of people don't realize um, that he is also a singer and songwriter and he never recorded and released any music as an album and never signed a record deal or anything because he said he didn't want to go that way. Um, so he just loved music and loves to perform music and write music for himself. And he had some recorded songs that actually ended up in Twilight. And there's a scene where he is in the scene prominent in the scene with dialogue and then one of his songs is playing in the scene in the background and I remember watching that and going that is my motherfucking dream to actually be in a movie as an actor that I've dedicated my life to especially to film and to have one of my songs in it too and not just in it but in a scene that I'm in that's it man that's the dream he's doing it he's living my dream and very shortly after that I was approached by Robert Ryan, again, from Girls and Corpses magazine, who was doing some publicity for this new film called Predator World. Um, And there was an issue with the song that they had or that they needed or needed a replacement in this in this um, film. And he was friends with the um, distributors. He was doing a lot of promotion and whatnot, advertising in his magazine. And the distributor was tripping out that he needed this song and needed to replace the song and needed a song. And Robert Ryan remembered me and suggested me and said, hey, Victoria DeMar. And I was in this film, Predator World. And he said, hey, um, and it actually happened to be a scene that I was in. And so Robert had thought of me and suggested me. He's like, hey, Victoria is in this scene. And, you know, Victoria is the songwriter and she has music. And he was like, does she own her own music and own all her masters? And he's like, I believe she does. Um, you know, let me reach out to her. And so he had reached out to me and I was like, yeah, I do. And he was perusing through a bunch of songs online that he sent to the distributor and the distributor picked one, um, which was actually off my first album. It was a, a power pop punk rock song called So Long. And they decided to license it. And it was amazing. And they're sending me this contract and this licensing fee. And I'm going, oh, my God. And I had actually gotten one of my songs in a film that I was in 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 the actual scene. So once that happened, I was like, oh, my God, because before that I had been in and out of the bucket and on the cue sheet for um, a, a Warner Brothers picture um, that Warren Beatty was actually directing and had written and was starring in, um, about Howard Hughes. And I'm a catalog artist and songwriter over at Warner Group Music. And, um, so I have a ton of songs, almost my whole catalog of my own songs in their catalog, which of course is millions of songs. But, um, I had gotten what they call in the bucket, um, or on the cue, uh, potential for the cue sheet or on the table or whatever the technical term in the business is in the bucket of all the songs that they're pulling from the catalog and putting in their bucket to go into the feature. And there were two songs of mine that were pulled that were in the bucket. And I thought, oh my God, if I get a license from a studio film, that's going to earn me a publishing contract um, with a major publishing company, which is um, suddenly going to be a massively like successful songwriter or like being able to like write and record songs all day long, like for like a living for like, like a massive amount of money, like six figures. And I was like, Oh, I can't even believe this. And Warren Beatty is very difficult to work with. So he kept um, insisting that Warner brothers make a final film cut of the film and take that action.